Right, in an attempt to reach as many of you as possible, I've decided to do a little live this morning, which is not something I normally do here on my YouTube channel. I did this uh, one week ago over on my Instagram, which is the same username, incidentally, if you want to go and head across to that account. So that's the underscore Gardener Ben. Now, obviously, as you know, you are hopefully here for roses. Um, I am a David Austin rose expert. I am an all-round rose expert across all brands of English bred roses. I'm also uh, a full-time, fully qualified, uh, degree-level gardener uh, working full-time in the industry. I have been done for 28 years now. It's a staggering amount of time that I've invested into the horticultural industry myself and obviously have a large, um, a domestic half an acre cottage garden here surrounding my thatched cottage in the outskirts of the New Forest in Hampshire in the UK. The reason for this particular live is about pest control. We are at that stage here in the UK now that um, the spring is waking up, the garden is waking up and pest control is becoming a real topic across all platforms that I talk about um, on Instagram and on TikTok, on Facebook and now here on YouTube and I wanted to address uh, one or two things about pest control in the garden um, and really ask you as gardeners to calm down, really calm down and just take a breath and just relax and breathe for just a moment. I will do my level best to remain calm. This is something that I feel very, very passionately about. And also not to square, because sometimes Gardener Ben has a little bit of a potty mouth, so I do have to be a little bit careful. We're at that stage now in the garden where everything is waking up, especially the roses, and they are absolutely adored by aphids, black fly, green fly very, very specifically at this time of year. And aphids, green fly, black fly, make up the fundamental cornerstones of pretty much all of the food chain in the garden. If you are claiming that you are an organic gardener and you are still spraying anything or removing aphids and green fly from your garden, with any way other than normal pests, as in ladybirds and hoverfly larvae and other things like that, you're not really embracing the organic gardening method particularly very well. Your chemical that you use, whether it's Nemo oil, whether it's um, organic soap suds, or any, or even washing them off with the hose, by removing the, corn, the cornerstone of the life cycle in the garden, you will never end up with the predatory insects that you need to actually eat them in the first place. So you have to enter this sort of zen state for one or sometimes two years and just let your garden be. It's very, very important that um, you leave them alone and you allow something else to eat them. Green fly, black fly, aphids are gonna appear all over your garden, especially on your roses. They absolutely love the soft, soft growth as it appears on the roses and they're a sap eating insect. So at this time of year, there you will see them and I posted a picture to my, uh, to my grid on my Instagram just yesterday and I'll move it across here to YouTube so you can see it. Um, but I posted a picture just a couple of days ago of that, uh, which is a Harlow car by David Austin Roses and it has a colony of green fly and brown aphids on it that are probably about 150 maybe 200 strong and the shock that a lot of people have gone into over that post absolute blind panic about aphids on your uh, on your plants now there's nothing to worry about a strong and healthy plant will deal with that infestation very very easily and this is the very very beginning of the season this colony is literally just a few days old and if you don't leave it there as uh, food for other things, I say you won't end up with any uh, ho um, hoverfly larvae or wasp larvae, and you certainly won't end up with any ladybirds in the garden. So one of the best things for you to do as an organic gardener is to simply leave them alone. Enter this zen state and just leave them be. I can't bear, and, and one of the things that I'm really struggling about with as a social media gardener as well is people's attitudes to looking after one thing and deciding they need to undisputably kill another. For me, the garden is not mine. I have over half an acre here, uh, over 250 roses in the ground now. I'm famed for my roses, dahlias and sweet peas. Uh, those are the bits that I really, really specialise in. But I'm not the gardener here, well I am the gardener here because I'm the one that looks after it, but the garden is not mine. Um, the garden I just caretake, I am, I am the caretaker of my space uh, and it is really important that we enter this state of just letting everything be. 
if you allow any garden uh, to just relax and just find its natural equilibrium and its balance over a period of time a lot of the problems as you have that you have as a gardener um, will actually even out and stabilize that move making into the organic sector is very very difficult and the first couple of years can be really worrying and i'm asking you to hold your ground and trust the process and the fact that nature will return to your garden in all of its balance and deal with the pests and the problems that you may be experiencing if i leave the green fly black fly aphid on the plant in about 10 to 14 days i'm going to receive a population of ladybirds hoverfly or even earwigs which a lot of you don't like as well but all of these creatures in larvae form and in adult form have voracious appetites for eating things like aphids as well as uh, nice big brown ones will be eaten by wrens and blue tits and great tits and the smaller birds in the garden what i don't understand as a gardener as well is a lot of you with this obsession with feeding the birds and trying to encourage birds into your garden and that's a wonderful thing but your peanuts and your wild bird seed and your rape seed that you're bringing into your garden sunflower seeds all of those things are traveling off of the hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles to your garden so you can feed them to the birds well actually all you need to do is work on building some habitat in your garden and allowing things like green fly black fly aphids caterpillars sawfly a cabbage white butterfly into your garden and just allow them to be the birds and everybody else will come along eventually and eat them and balance out the population and there is something about the rose grower and i'm not sure whether it comes from our um uh our ancestry through into the obviously if you look at the stages of gardening over the last maybe 50 60 years roses really in the 50s 60s and 70s this very very clinical way of growing roses and dahlias and chrysanthemums all of those old things that i specialize in here um that are very very clinical and they have to be absolutely perfect now i don't mind sharing the blooms in my garden with one or two green excuse me one or two green fly black fly aphids um I, they don't really bother me at all and i'm not really uh, bothered by the odd earwig um or anything else that i might find snuffling around in a um <laughs> In a rose bloom so i'm just asking you as an organic as if you're claiming to be organic even if you're using products like nemo oil or soap suds uh, organic soap suds that realistically it goes against the principles of actually just allowing the yoga garden to be so dozens of messages over the last couple of days of people very proudly saying oh i go out and squash them well, again that's better than actually using any form of spray or chemical on them or even an organic chemical however by removing that cornerstone food source you are not going to end up with all of the beneficial insects we've spoken about already so this post is particularly about just entering that zen state and allowing at the very early stages of the year here here in april and the sign that the green fly black fly aphid and the caterpillars and stuff are emerging are a sure sign that actually the, uh, the garden is waking up, spring has arrived, the weather has broken, and it's been horrible here in the UK. I'm not sure where you're joining me from in the world, but here in the UK, the winter has been cold, it's been dark, it's been long, it's been incredibly wet. Now, climate change has made the, the is looking that the UK is actually entering into these, we've lost four seasons. We basically now only have two. We have a cold, wet winter where we receive almost a year's or nine months worth of rainfall. In that winter period, it's bitterly cold and sopping wet. And we then, the light switches on, the sun comes on uh, in around late April and we will bake dry. Uh, we've seen excessive temperatures here in the UK now of over 30 to 35 on several occasions, which I know a lot of you in the world um, will, won't be phased by. But here in the UK, that is very, very hot. We've gone up to nine weeks without rain last year, which was catastrophic across most English gardens, uh, host pipe bans and water restrictions in place because we went so long without water. And again, I know a lot of you in the world will be looking at that thinking, well, nine weeks without water is not particularly long. But here in the UK, where we have a wet temperate climate, that is very, very different. Um, so we're entering into these two different stages and we now have spring is broken and everything is waking up. So there you fall, you're going to see in your garden a population explosion of things that have overwintered so you're going to see black fly green fly aphids you're going to see caterpillars you're going to think things waking up and before your uh, predatory insects can have uh, a go at them they obviously their life cycle is always going to be between 10 14 or two weeks behind um 
the actual food source that they're eating on. So now we're seeing the weather improving. The nesting birds have started to raise uh, their chicks. Now uh, the robins in the garden have already brought um, one batch of uh, little baby chicks. Now I thought they were very, very early and unfortunately they have lost quite a few of them. Nothing I can really do to, to interact with that, but they will, they will produce another brood and probably two more broods throughout the year. But now the population of green fly, black fly aphids and the caterpillars and things are starting to actually um, uh, appear in the garden. Those are all of their food sources. Uh, and you really, really must leave them alone and just enter it into this Zen state of just letting things be. The other thing the, uh, that's now being popped up on my, uh, on my grid all over the place is the issue of black spot with roses, very, very common in an awful lot of the weaker varieties. Um, and it's something that I talk to you an awful lot with by Rose Reviews. It's about the disease resistance of a rose, along with its fragrance and its other performances, its growth habit, uh, its, um, uh, its form and texture, very, very important to me as a rose grower. And, but the easiest way of actually avoiding black spot is to avoid stress. Plants like humans suffer very, very badly when they are stressed. Uh, if you don't sleep as a human, if you don't eat properly, if you don't get plenty of rest and drink plenty of water, you're going to be susceptible to becoming ill. Uh, you're going to be tired and you're going to be stressed and you're going to have stomach problems and you could probably get colds and flus. Well, all of those things are going to stress your body out. Roses and other plants are exactly the same. So if you aim as an organic gardener to actually just alleviate the stress in the garden plants that you grow, you will quite easily eradicate all of the problems that your garden might create. Um, now I know I'm making this out to seem really quite simple and it really is very, very simple. There's a very basic way of gardening and if you look after your plants and look after your soil, your plants and soil will look after you. So what I'm saying to you is if you're looking to alleviate black spot, mold and mildew in the garden, alleviate the points of stress. Now on roses, that's generally down to soil condition and watering, and both of those can be addressed by mulching. Uh, and lots and lots of questions arriving in my inbox and my comment sections over the last few weeks about what mulching is. Now, it's obviously for me, it's, um, it's really basic. I have associations with uh, a local company producing organic soil conditions and mulches and re um, recycling aggregates and soils here on the south coast of the UK. And I'm very, very proud of that association with Eco Sustainable Solutions. Uh, they are their products are now available across Amazon for the UK delivery. If you're joining me somewhere else in the world, uh, the you're going to have to take the basic principles from what I'm just about to talk to you about about mulches. Mulches can take any form that you like, and you really must look at mulching your garden at least once a year. This is not something you can skip as an organic gardener. And I know the cost of it sometimes is absolutely eye-watering, so you need to find the balance that's right for you. Doing one area well is better than doing part of the garden not well. So if for like me, I have over half an acre, I go through 10 cubic meters. That's around seven tons of soil conditioner every single winter. I mulch everything, absolutely everything in the garden is mulched to a depth of at least four inches, 100 millimeters with a 100% peat-free recycled organic compost. Now, Eco Sustainable Solutions take green waste uh, that is produced by people like me, tree surgeons and other professional gardeners, also curbside collections from our local council go in the green weedy bins, they take that away and they turn that into garden compost. So your mulch can be anything that you choose it to be. It can be bark nuggets, bark chips, it can be wood chip uh, produced by tree surgeons, it can be shredded straw, spent mushroom compost, well rotted horse or cow manure. Now cow manure is much much better than horse manure uh, on the basic principle that even rotted down after two or three years, horses only have one stomach uh, to my knowledge. Maybe I have that wrong, they might have two. But anyway, cows certainly have four stomachs and all of the weed seed that goes through a cow stomach is generally eradicated by its digestive process. So you won't end up with so many weeds in the garden if you choose cow manure products over horse manure. Um, so it's a bit of a, a toss up between both. So uh, you can also use leaf mulch or shredded straw um, shredded newspaper and cardboard is also a good one but whatever you do you have to add large amounts of organic matter to your soil over recent decades and I'm talking about decades uh, gardens all over the world have become these incredibly clinical spaces and that really came from the back end of the second world war when we were growing huge amounts of vegetables and fruit in our gardens 
the spaces became incredibly clinical and we've got into this habit of gardeners of cleaning up everything. We have to collect the, uh, the grass clippings, for instance. We have to collect the leaves. We have to cut the herbaceous perennials down and dead head. And we have to take all of those items away from our garden and we have to dispose of them. But that means over a period of time, your soil structure, your soil condition in the garden will really, really suffer. It needs fresh organic content every single year. So whether that's fallen leaves or whether that's compost you produce in the garden or whether that's like me who still want the garden tidy. And I'm going to admit, I still do want the garden tidy. I still want it to look nice, but then I'm bringing back in 100% organic compost locally sourced because I mean, I'm, I'm the one producing the green waste in the first place and taking that to eco sustainable solutions. And then I'm bringing it back in as a fully composted product. Now I have an awful lot of space. But selfishly, I don't want huge amounts of compost bins and rats and other things in the garden. So I choose to bring that back in and I obviously drive a three and a half ton truck for work. So I have the ability to move these items around in bulk. But Eco will deliver your mulch if you wanted to, if you're here in the UK, in a large dumpy bag for you to shovel out and spread out. But you really must look after the soil condition of your actual garden and you must be mulching it with something. I say the list is endless of what you can use, but you have to be adding organic matter to your soil every single year to a depth of around four inches, a hundred millimeters. It's quite a lot. So it's about that. Uh, if you imagine a square fence post, that's 100 millimeters, a six inch ruler, it's almost three quarters of that. A depth all over the soil. Now, if you're like me, you're growing other plants, peonies, bearded irises. You need to um, avoid mulching around those items so we just create a small donut of clear soil around those but the roses and the best of the garden including the vegetable garden and the trial beds they're all mulched every single year and over a period of time it will do wonders for your garden. Not only will it eradicate a lot of the weeds. You won't have to do a lot of weeding. Um, you will also seal in a huge amount of moisture. Below in the soil surface, well-conditioned soil has the ability to hold a staggering 30% more water, more water than unconditioned soil. So that adding that organic matter has a huge beneficial effect to long-term keeping your garden watered over the, wind, over the summer months when it's particularly dry, sealing in the moisture below ground. It also, on the flip side of that, drains much better and doesn't become waterlogged over the winter. So if you're working on a heavy clay soil, mulching to a depth of around four inches, 100 millimeters over the winter, several years, one after the other, will mean you never have to dig the soil heavy clay soils and uh, with uh, that are very sedimentary, or sorry, very silty, are very difficult to work at certain times of year. But by mulching over the top of them, your soil creatures, your worms, for instance, will come up through the soil and drag all that organic matter down into the soil, opening up its structure and improving the garden no end. Again, I get dozens of messages from people every single spring of how to eradicate soil uh, worm casts on their lawns. I mean, to me, it, as a gardener, it's a, it's a complete and utter bizarre experience that you would want to get rid of worm casts. As a gardener, I'm thinking that's a really good sign. I'm thinking as a horticulturalist that the worm activity in your lawn is aerating it and bringing, dragging organic matter from the soil surface down into the subsoil of the lawn and improving its structure. So please do take these signs from mother nature that they're positive. If you've got worm casts on your lawn, that means your soil that was compacted is now opening up. The worms are coming up through it and they're dragging things down into the soil and producing worm casts as they go, which is fertilizer natural fertilizer they've munched their way through soil and organic matter and they're pooping out um uh free soil conditioner for you all over your lawn it's a great thing so the reason for this particular post was to touch on the use of mulches and how you can use those to alleviate uh, black spot and mold and mildew by sealing in moisture improving soil structure um, and also uh, to touch on the basis of aphids green fly black fly and other pests in the garden another recent post from myself on instagram was about dividing hostas and the fact that i keep my potted hostas in large sources of water as to act as a moat around the plant to completely alleviate any problems with slugs and snails. People are saying, well, shall I put beer in them? It's like, well, no, just use water. Slugs and snails can't walk on water. Nothing can really walk on water, um, <laughs> unless you believe otherwise, but 
realistically, uh, just put a, mo a, a source of water around your hostas and you'll never have a slug or snail problem ever, ever again. If the leaves touch something else, creating a bridge in, yes, you will then get slugs and snails in there. But if you keep them in an open space, don't let them touch anything else and put a source of water under your hostas, there are really, really easy ways of controlling the pests in your garden and, and making sure that your plants stay healthy. So the reason for this particular online rant this morning was to really take a step back and just relax into your garden just a little bit and just let it be after one or two years full cycle mine is now into its fifth or sixth year at this particular garden the last garden was organic uh for about four or five years before that but obviously you're coming here new i had to just let it even out and just had to be bold build lots and lots of habitat by keeping um, organic matter in the garden. I've built huge bug hotels and if anybody has any interest in those please do drop me a message or a comment and I will uh, point you in the direction of the, the videos and tutorials of how to do those but keeping lots and lots of texture in your garden things like um, broken up bean canes, um, uh, uh, large pine cones, scrunched up um, uh, chicken wire, all of those things, broken up plant pots, all of those places, fantastic texture for little creatures to live in over winter. And a lot of you have seen me post those little terracotta pots all over the garden. A lot of my roses need support and I embrace their growth habits rather than fighting their growth habits. So for instance, Olivia Rose Ostium, which is a little bit on the floppy side, needs some help and protection standing up. She has a series of um, uh, hazel canes put in around the plant which with a web of um, uh, uh, straw or twine just to keep the canes upright and on the top of those I'll hang little three and four inch terracotta pots and I'll stuff them with straw. Uh, one, they stop me spiking my eyes on the plant when I'm deadheading or weeding in the borders. They look really cute. I mean, I absolutely love the way they look. They're out there all winter. They also make a really cute noise when they knock about. It's like a little wind chime, which I really love. But more importantly, the reason why I do that is because they're somewhere for the mini beasts to live over the winter and during and find somewhere to hide. I've often found wrens nesting in them as well, which is really quite cute. But ladybirds and especially hoverfly larvae and things like earwigs overwinter in those little tony pots and then they're in the garden ready to go. Anyway, I need to wrap up this live. So we've talked about mulches and their use of mulches in the garden to alleviate stress, seal in moisture and um, uh, basically improve the condition of soil and also the fact that you just need to let the cornerstone um, of your ecosystem in the garden, your aphids, your green fly, your black fly, your caterpillars just exist long enough for your predatory insects or your predatory birds to come along and actually eat those and then you won't have to feed the birds either, you'll save yourself some money. Anyway, if you've got any questions, you obviously know how to get hold of me. On a closing note, if you're here in the UK, please do feel free to join me at Wisley this coming Saturday, that's Saturday the 22nd of April. I will be giving a talk at Wisley on irises and their use in the modern cottage garden um, at 2 p.m. at Wisley here in the UK. So do catch me there at RHS Wisley, where I'll be giving a talk at 2 p.m. this coming Saturday. Thank you to everybody that's joined me. I will post this live to my grid, so if I've missed your question and you have anything you'd like to talk to me about, you can always leave me a comment. However, also join me over on my Instagram, where I'm much, much more active than I hear I'm on YouTube. Same handle, it's the underscore garden, the Ben even wearing a t-shirt this morning. Anyway, I'll see you all again soon. Take care now, bye-bye.